All right, and it is about that time. Welcome everyone to 60 Minutes in Space. Uh, my name is Mitch and during the program, I will be watching the chat. So if at any point you have uh, questions or anything like that, type it in the chat um, and you won't see each other's chats, but I will be keeping an eye on it and I will hold on to all of your questions for the end. And so with no further ado, I'd like to introduce the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, Curator of Space Sciences, Kachun Yu. Take it away, Kachun. All right, um, thank you very much, Mitch. Um, so welcome everyone. Um, as Mitch has been saying, um, this is 60 Minutes in Space. And uh, for those of you who might be tuning in for the first time, uh, this is a program where we um, talk about um, mo the most recent uh, space science news uh, that interest uh, the speakers and the presenters. And uh, typically I uh, present um, astronomy and astrophysics, meaning uh, topics outside of our solar system. Uh, but as it turns out, our uh, guest um, speaker for tonight, uh, Mark Nyrink, um, will also be presenting on um, astrophysics and more specifically, cosmology. And I um, will um, introduce Mark um, later on. Um, he'll have a really cool uh, presentation that involves um, kind of a, a combination of art and science. And so um, if you want to get ready for that, um, go ahead and find a um, sheet of paper. It could be a piece of printing, uh, printer paper or um, some junk mail or uh, a sheet of newspaper, if you still get the newspaper, but Mark will be um, showing you how can, um, you can use that sheet of paper to learn a little bit about cosmology. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and um, get my uh, presentation started. And I actually have um, two stories, one um, pretty long and one kind of short. And so let me go ahead and share my screen. And uh, my first um, story, um, has to do with um, this paper that just came out um, this past month. And um, it's from a group at Harvard um, Center for Astrophysics. Um, and the, uh, the main author is Shmuel um, Bialy, but uh, it also includes Catherine Zucker and Alyssa Goodman, um, who have done a lot of um, work um, in um, star formation and understanding how um, giant molecular clouds um, in our galaxy um, are shaped and, and where they are. And so this work um, kind of builds on the previous work. And, um, and it's something that I even talked about about a year, um, almost two years ago um, in, in um, a paper where they um, used um, very um, similar um, types of analyses. But um, so let's um, go ahead and um, jump into um, what, um, what this particular study is about. And it's basically about trying to understand uh, gas and dust clouds. And so um, these are clouds in our galaxy and they're actually very important because they, um, these clouds um, are places where stars form. And so um, our sun um, probably, and, and our solar system probably formed um, in clouds um, similar to these four and a half billion years ago. And so understanding uh, these clouds um, really helps us understand the star formation process. And so uh, the two clouds that we're interested in are um, known as the Taurus and Perseus clouds. And they're so named um, just because they're located in the constellations of um, Taurus and Perseus. And, uh, and, and um, we'll see in just a minute, these are actually locations in the sky. You can actually go out and look at um, if, you, um, if you go out um, after this program um, tonight. And, um, and this is a map um, just showing um, that the white is um, emission from dust um, that um, was observed by the, uh, the Planck um, satellite. Um, and, and so, here I'm seeing uh, the clouds um, shown in blue and in red. And, um, and what uh, the, uh, the, the group did was to, um, to figure out exactly how far away uh, these clouds are. And so here, again, you're, um, you're seeing uh, those uh, the blue and red clouds representing Taurus and Perseus, but the colors now uh, represent the distance uh, from the sun. And so um, you can see that the closest um, clouds are about 125 parsecs and the furthest um, are about um, just over 300 parsecs. And so that's um, just under 500 light years to um, just uh, under a thousand light years away. And for a really long time, it was um, actually very difficult to really determine distances. And so um, we are now at a point where the data sets that have been accumulated by astronomers have now allowed um, us to um, get um, pretty accurate distances uh, to clouds like this. So let's uh, jump into the story by um, just um, talking about 
our galaxy. So our galaxy is a barred spiral, and it has a number of these wonderful um, spiral arms, which give, um, which I, um, identify the type of galaxy that we're on. So those arms are sort of like a pinwheel, and our sun is in what's known as the Orion spur um, of, um, of the Perseus arm. And the galaxy, you know, we're looking down on it, it sort of looks like a fried egg with the, uh, the bright um, bulge of the galaxy at the center. And, um, and it's even um, sort of shaped like a fried egg because the, uh, most of the, um, what you see um, in the spiral arms actually form a disk. And, um, and because the sun is located about halfway uh, from the center of the galaxy out to the edge, and it's also um, kind of sitting in the middle of that disk, when we look out into the night sky, we see a band uh, that people have historically called the Milky Way. So if you live in Denver, um, you really can't see the Milky Way because of city lights. But if you go out to a really dark site, um, you'll see uh, this kind of marvelous, um, beautiful, um, but still very faint um, band that crosses the sky. And if you take a long exposure photograph, like here, you see um, the wonderful um, glow of the Milky Way with all these dark uh, patches showing up. Now, um, these dark patches, let's uh, um, concentrate on them, um, are really due to um, gas and dust clouds in the Milky Way. And so again, remember the sun and our solar system is sitting inside the disk of the Milky Way. And so that disk appears to surround us in, um, in this kind of glowing band. And those dark regions are actually um, dark uh, gas and dust clouds that are between us and the stars. And um, when you look out into them, there are, um, it's not immediately obvious how far away these clouds are. And so um, there could be clouds that are closer to us um, and, um, and th they could be masking or obscuring clouds that are further away. Um, there could be stars in between uh, these clouds. And so um, just by um, imaging or photographing the night sky like this, um, you don't immediately get information about how far uh, these um, clouds are. And so um, there are, are a number of ways in which you can um, start trying to figure out the distances of these clouds. One is using a technique called interstellar reddening. And the idea is that um, the starlight that passes through these clouds, um, their light um, actually gets affected in different ways, depending on which wavelengths or which colors of light you're looking at. And so here's a very famous cloud called Barnard 68. And it's in the uh, constellation of Ophiuchus. And you can see that um, if you look right through the center of the cloud, uh, the cloud um, is very black. And you don't see any starlight at all. And that's because the cloud is so thick that it blocks all the starlight coming through. But if you look at the edges of the cloud, you'll see um, what look like very faint reddish stars. And in fact, um, they're, you know, they're, <clears throat> the, the cloud is blocking most of the starlight. But um, it blocks uh, preferentially blue light more so than red light. And so at the edges of the cloud, um, where the cloud isn't as dense um, and it's not as thick, you can uh, start seeing some of the red light um, kind of uh, peeking through. And as you get closer and closer or further away from the center of the cloud um, and further um, out into the edges, you start seeing more and more um, starlight um, until um, after um, the boundary, at the, um, well away from the um, edges of the cloud, um, you see uh, the starlight um, unimpeded. And, um, and so uh, the, these clouds uh, definitely uh, uh, block um, redder light, or, or they um, block the blue light, and they let in the red light. And, um, and they um, also do this um, if you go into the infrared, which is um, even redder or, um, or longer wavelength than the visible um, light that we can see. And so this is an image in the infrared. And so you can see that um, there are even uh, more stars that are visible. And in fact, um, the, um, the cloud actually looks um, transparent. Um, and so you can use um, reddening uh, by uh, measuring um, how um, starlight is preferentially blocked by gas and dust uh, to give you an idea of um, or at least how much gas and dust is um, in your line of sight um, that's um, covering up um, that starlight. And then the other um, bit of information that you need is actually uh, the distance to these stars. And so uh, this 
Um, there's been a, a real revolution in our understanding of how far um, stars are based on the Gaia satellite, which is a satellite launched by the European um, Space Agency. And what it does is it measures the distances to stars very accurately using a process um, called um, known as parallax. And basically the idea is this um, satellite um, is um, orbiting the sun um, in the same way that the earth is. And when it observes distant stars, you'll see the more nearby stars um, appear to shift in their position um, against the background of stars that are much further away. And so um, if it looks from one side of um, its orbit uh, um, around the sun versus the other side, um, you'll see um, the uh, foreground stars, the nearby stars shift. And we can see this in this animation. And so this is um, an animation um, that simulates um, how um, stars would appear um, as observed by Gaia. And so you can see that the more nearby stars, they actually trace um, larger circles, whereas the more distant stars, they trace much smaller circles because they're um, much further away. And, um, and it's actually even more complicated than that uh, because the stars are not completely stationary in the sky, but they're orbiting um, our galaxy. And so they, they have some motion. And so over time, um, you have to um, be able to subtract out the, um, what's known as the proper motions of these stars, in addition to seeing uh, the, the circular motions due to uh, the Gaia satellites orbit around the sun. And um, when you look at the galaxy as a whole, uh, this is um, sort of what you um, get. This is again, uh, simulation and, um, and the parallax or the, the amount of um, motion that we see in these stars as a result of um, Gaia's orbit around the sun, it's been, um, that's been exaggerated by a factor of about 100,000. And so you wouldn't actually see this much uh, motion, but if you exaggerate it, um, you can see um, how uh, very, um, familiar stars, um, at least in familiar constellations, would have these very exaggerated motions. And then um, in just a second, this animation will show you what happens if you also include in the proper motions, the, uh, the motions of the stars as they orbit our galaxy. And, uh, and these motions have been exaggerated or increased by a factor of a trillion. And so normally, you know, these um, wouldn't normally be so easily seen. But if you exaggerate it by a factor of a trillion, you notice these stars um, really um, moving across the sky. So um, that's how um, Gaia, um, by figuring out um, the motions of these stars, we can, um, through geometry and trigonometry, figure out the distances to these stars. Um, and so it's basically a combination of, of the stellar distances along with the reddening effects that um, the um, astronomy team from Harvard was able to uh, figure out the, um, the distances to these gas and dust clouds. So let's uh, look a little bit more uh, closely at these clouds. And like I said earlier, these gas and dust clouds are actually visible in the nighttime sky. So if you go out um, tonight, you'll see uh, the Pleiades, you'll see the constellation of Orion towards our southern sky. And the Pleiades are the seven sisters. They're pretty easy um, to spot. Uh, but um, just above them um, are the, um, the dark um, gas clouds of Perseus and um, Taurus. And these don't really look like much of anything um, to your naked eye, even if you're up in the mountains where it was sufficiently dark. And, and that's just because um, these are regions with um, gas and dust. And these are regions um, where um, stars are, are forming. Uh, but uh, because um, those Perseus and Taurus clouds are uh, mostly um, gas and dust, um, they are blocking um, starlight um, from stars behind them. And so um, they don't really look um, much like anything. Although if you have um, like a really good uh, telescope, you might be able to spot the California uh, Nebula, which is a region uh, that's uh, ionized by, um, by massive stars. It um, sort of sits off of um, the Perseus cloud, although it's not part of um, the Perseus cloud. Um, but um, <clears throat> these, uh, the Perseus and Taurus clouds are regions that have been intensely studied by astronomers for many decades. Um, we have observed hundreds of young uh, stars that have been born out of um, these um, gas clouds. 
And, um, and there are also um, some massive stars that are sprinkled around the Perseus cloud. That's what those um, weird little dots with the, um, the X's are. Those are massive stars uh, that, um, that have been born in the last um, six to 10 million years. And so, um, so we know that there's been um, lots of star formation in this region over the last 10 million years, but there's um, ongoing star formation inside uh, these um, dark clouds currently in the last million years or so. Now, uh, these regions, as I said, have been um, studied by astronomers uh, for many decades. And so here is a, um, a diagram or a, a figure from a paper from 1987, um, where um, the astronomers used a radio telescope to map the gas in these clouds. And so um, you can see that um, if you uh, flip between uh, these two images, you sort of get a sense of um, those, um, those gas and dust clouds. And, um, and even though astronomers can use radio telescopes to measure the velocities of these clouds, and they um, have, and, and through some inferences, um, they um, have um, a rough idea, um, even back then in the 1980s, that uh, these two clouds uh, seem to be at, at different distances, but uh, they were still um, not sure. So if you look at the, uh, this particular paper, there's even a section where the, um, the, the authors ask of the Taurus and IC348 clouds connected. And IC348 is just a star forming complex inside Perseus. And so they were wondering whether uh, this bridge of material that seems to connect the Taurus clouds and the Perseus clouds um, might actually be a real physical connection or whether um, these two clouds aren't related at all and they just happen um, to be superimposed in the sky. And, uh, and this has been a question for, for a long time because even though um, there's evidence that the, the stars in these two clouds are somewhat separated, um, there's enough uncertainties in the observational data that astronomers um, just weren't sure. And so that's why um, this recent work is so important. And so here is a, an, an animation of, um, of an interface or an interactive that you can actually go um, online um, that you can find. Um, and if you, um, there, there are a couple of QR codes um, at the top. So if you uh, point your smartphone at this, you can actually um, get an app that allows you to, to interact with this data set um, yourself. So you might wanna, depending on how big your screen is, uh, you can try uh, pointing your smartphone um, unfortunately, I tried my uh, phone and it crashed. So hopefully um, you'll have better luck. But uh, we're seeing uh, the Perseus and the Taurus clouds. Um, so they're outlined in blue and red. And um, the yellow uh, point is actually an arrow that points towards the sun. And so you can see that the sun is located off towards the side. And based on this new technique of um, really um, nailing the uh, distances to these clouds, what this um, team found was that these clouds are not um, linked together, but they're actually separated and they appear to be um, on the boundaries of a sphere or a giant void in space. And so now we're rotating around uh, to see it from, from the top. And so you can see that the uh, Taurus cloud in blue and the Perseus cloud in red are actually um, at the edges of this giant spherical uh, void. And so that is um, really, really interesting uh, because of what we know about how um, star formation works. So, um, so what does this mean? And um, to, in order to explain this, I need to um, sort of go through a, um, a very quick um, explanation of um, how um, kind of the ecology of star formation works in our, in our, in our and other galaxies. And so stars form in um, what are known as giant molecular clouds. And so these are those giant um, clouds of gas and dust that we've been talking about um, since the beginning of my presentation. Those are those um, dark regions that we see um, against um, the, um, the stars, the background stars in our galaxy. And when these giant clouds um, have um, dense regions that are gravitationally unstable, they can um, collapse and form stars. And so you have um, clusters of um, young stars that are inside these clouds. Uh, but what happens is that over time, these um, stars will have um, winds, they'll have jets, they, um, and those winds and jets, um, along with um, ultraviolet radiation, disrupt and break apart the surrounding um, cloud gas. 
And some of these um, stars, especially if there are lots of stars that um, form, some of them might also end up being massive stars. These are stars with at least eight times the mass of our sun. And these stars um, have um, really powerful winds. They have um, lots of ionizing ultraviolet radiation. And these stars also um, explode in supernova. And so these stars are extremely disruptive and they can destroy um, the surrounding gas clouds via the supernova. And the, um, the energy, energy from the supernova can even uh, push and compress the surrounding interstellar medium and compress the clouds um, into, um, and compress the gas into new clouds. And so people have long wondered whether supernova could actually um, cause new waves of star formation. So if the supernova can push um, the surrounding gas and push them into um, clouds, um, that could potentially um, lead to a new wave of star formation. And so astronomers have studied this uh, both theoretically and using computer simulations. So here's a simulation from about a decade ago where the um, astronomers um, looked at how um, you could have two um, windblown, um, what they call super bubbles. So these bubbles of gas that uh, are being pushed out by supernovae and by winds of giant stars. And so here, um, those two um, windblown bubbles are represented in blue. The green is the surrounding interstellar gas um, that's um, you know, real, of uniform density, at least at the start of the simulation. And this is what it looks like at three million years. And then at seven million years, it's compressed that gas and there's a lot of turbulence and you can see how um, there's a lot of um, really complicated st structure, but at the bottom, we have these filaments that have been formed. And so um, it's thought that um, these types of windblown structures could compress uh, the surrounding gas into um, this gas structures that we see in molecular clouds. And so the question, um, now uh, becomes, um, you know, is um, this um, what has happened with um, the Taurus and Perseus um, clouds? And, um, and that um, um, might um, indeed um, be the case. So when they um, uh, measure the distances, they find that the Taurus clouds, um, again, um, you know, we've known for a long time that they tend to be um, the closest um, to the sun but we've really um, put a firm a distance on them um, so that um, the vast majority of the clouds are about 490 light years from the sun. And that uh, the Perseus clouds are almost a thousand light years from the sun. They're on the other side of this um, giant void. And it's thought that um, because uh, the spherical void seems to uh, fit the, uh, the boundaries of the clouds so well, um, this, um, what's observed and what's interpreted from the observations seem to support the idea that um, there were uh, multiple massive stars at the center of this void and that they um, exploded and the, um, the, the explosions drove uh, or pushed the gas out, um, sort of like, um, you know, if you had a big snowstorm and you had a, a snow plow uh, plowing the roads, uh, that snowplow would plow or push the snow ahead. And so um, these gas clouds um, could be the supernova's way of snow plowing the surrounding gas into the Perseus and Taurus clouds. Um, and um, so, so this cloud is um, about 500 light years across. And um, when astronomers uh, make um, these sort of discoveries, what they often like to do is they like to um, go and find other supporting evidence um, to show that um, you know, what they um, are arguing um, is supported not just by um, this particular analysis, but, but by other observations. And so um, here um, on the left is um, the, uh, the dust map that we saw earlier. So um, we're again seeing the Perseus and Taurus um, dust clouds, the big um, green circle is um, that um, the shell of the sphere um, that we see in green here uh, projected onto the sky. And, um, and if you look at um, this region in, um, in hydrogen gas, atomic hydrogen gas, um, what you see is that there's actually a, a void or an empty region that roughly corresponds um, to where um, those, um, the Perseus 
and um, torus clouds are. So, so that's um, um, obviously very interesting, um, showing that um, there, um, yeah, this uh, does seem to show um, some evidence that um, there's um, gas that's been pushed away from the center. Um, it's obviously um, offset, so it's not um, quite at the center, um, but that could be uh, mean a number of different things. It could mean that um, some of the gas was denser in some regions, so it was easier uh, to expand in some uh, regions than others. But uh, I mean, just to show you um, how far back you can find evidence for this, um, there's actually a paper from 1974, um, and uh, I've um, aligned um, the figures in that paper, and uh, the um, author um, also observing in, um, in the radio and observing atomic hydrogen, you can see that um, their uh, boy um, corresponds pretty well to this more current um, data set. And um, when we look at, um, on, on the left, um, there's an image showing um, emission from ionized hydrogen. And so this um, emission comes from a hydrogen gas that's been exposed to um, ultraviolet and other ionizing um, um, radiation. And, um, and, and we see that as kind of a reddish glow. And so um, here you can see that there um, does tend to be some um, emission that's in the center of um, inside the, uh, the big green boundary. Um, again, indicating, um, giving some support to the idea that um, you know, this, there's hydrogen gas that's been excited by um, massive stars um, in the recent past. Now there is a, um, a, a kind of a bright lump that, uh, that sits at the, bound, um, at the inner um, circular boundary of the, of the void. That turns out to be the, uh, the California nebula that we saw earlier. And that's a feature that's actually much further away than the Perseus clouds. And so this um, kind of shows you how um, it can be um, difficult to interpret a lot of this data just because um, you know, it might not be obvious how far um, away the gas that's emitting is. And so here we, we had to have other information telling us how far the California Nebula is to know that that bright peak in emission doesn't actually, um, is probably not related to, to the void at all. And then um, on the left or on the right in the, uh, this purple image, we are seeing um, gamma rays. And uh, the gamma rays are, um, that we're seeing are tuned to a um, emission from an isotope of aluminum um, known as aluminum 26. And this particular um, atomic species is actually um, generated in supernova explosions. And, um, and so again, you see that there is um, some emission that seems to uh, be from inside the, uh, the, the, the big bubble uh, or the giant void. And um, so um, this again is some evidence that um, we're seeing um, leftover um, material from the supernova emission that's emitting in gamma rays. Um, and then, but, but again, you also see um, that emission uh, from elsewhere um, in that image as well. And so um, again, um, we don't uh, absolutely know um, how far away um, the, the gases uh, from um, that's emitting these gamma rays, but um, it, um, yeah, this is um, somewhat circumstantial you know, um, evidence, but um, it, it is um, also confirming. Uh, and then finally, um, these two images um, show X-ray um, emission. And again, um, kind of see uh, the same sort of evidence where um, there's very faint glow um, in X-rays um, that seem to be um, roughly um, aligned with the, the void that we see um, earlier. But again, um, we also know that there's lots of x-rays um, and also x-ray sources um, in the rest of these images. So although the um, evidence is confirming, it's um, you know, definitely not a total slam dunk, but that's um, true for um, um, all these other um, data sets and other wavelengths. So um, the, the basic uh, message is um, in conclusion, um, we have evidence that um, there are multiple supernovae that um, pro probably exploded in the last um, six million years or so um, that have expanded and um, created this giant super bubble and have created um, the Taurus and Perseus um, gas clouds. And um, six million years is kind of the, the minimum age 
And uh, we think that um, the structure, structure could be as old as 22 million years. And the upper limit is mainly due to the fact that um, this big empty void, um, it well does appear to be empty and has been filled in by gas that has um, slowly crept in from the rest of the galaxy. And so on the order of about 20 million years is kind of the upper limit for um, how long you'd expect this void to, to stay empty. And, um, and the, the age of this, um, this bubble um, as a result of supernovae expanding um, is pretty long. Six million years is actually um, longer than um, some of the um, stars that are um, currently uh, being formed um, in the Perseus and Taurus clouds. Uh, many of them are far younger. And so um, one idea behind this discrepancy is that there might have been multiple supernovae uh, that have gone off in the last six million years. And so you might have had up to half a dozen supernovae um, going off. And so um, they, uh, there might have been multiple episodes. And so the clouds that we see now um, could have been you know, very differently shaped just because they've been pushed and propelled along by those supernova. And, um, <clears throat> but uh, this is um, kind of an exciting um, type of result, um, like I said before, uh, for a really long time, astronomers have always, uh, it's always been difficult for astronomers to figure out exactly how far things are in the sky, especially for things as nebulous as gas and dust clouds. But this is a, a really promising and exciting technique um, to, um, to get us um, the, this three-dimensional information. And I'm gonna um, just talk briefly about one, one final um, story. And, um, and this connects well with the cosmological story that Mark um, will have. And it has to do with um, galaxies. And so um, this is a computer simulation um, from a few years ago. And it shows how um, galaxies um, over um, hundreds of millions of years, uh, they don't stay the same. What happens is even though the universe is expanding, um, the dominant force um, that shapes um, how things look in our universe is um, really gravity. And so gravity um, pulls on um, larger um, galaxies, have um, large enough gravity to pull in gas from the intergalactic medium. And they can also um, attract and cause um, smaller galaxies to spiral in and to merge. And so this um, simulation shows some of those merger scenarios, and you can see how dynamic um, galaxies are over um, the history of the universe, and how um, a, um, a, a spiral galaxy like our Milky Way can uh, result from multiple mergers. And here you can actually see uh, that spiral galaxies uh, merge um, and collide and merge with another galaxy. And um, so th this is um, something that astronomers um, are really interested in learning more about through computer simulations. And uh, there is a paper that came out uh, a couple months ago, so um, not uh, quite as recent as uh, the previous story, but uh, this was a cosmological simulation uh, where they um, try to show how um, the, the gas that feeds these galaxies, um, again, due mainly to gravity, um, can also feed into the central black holes. So uh, this paper is titled Cosmological Simulations of Quasar Fueling. And a quasar is basically a very early galaxy that has a central supermassive black hole at, at its center. And the gas that's feeding that black hole um, ends up um, helping to um, create um, lots of um, radiation from the center of the galaxy that's, um, that's emitted at, um, um, at um, huge amounts. And, um, and so um, this is the, um, the computer simulation and we're seeing uh, the galaxy at the center and the, the web of material is actually gas that um, is being drawn in towards um, the various galaxies. So there's a big central galaxy in the center, but you also see um, lots of smaller uh, galaxies uh, where the gravity of the smaller galaxies is also drawing in the gas. And the 100,000 um, light year um, circle represents roughly the, the size of um, our Milky Way galaxy. Um, it uh, might be a little bit bigger than uh, the actual um, galaxy in the simulation. 
but as we um, zoom in closer and closer, um, we're starting to see um, scales and structures that are now associated with the very innermost parts of uh, this galaxy where the supermassive black hole is located. Now, the simulation, um, although it includes um, stars and includes a lot of um, physics, um, including um, the hydrodynamics of the gas, the expansion of the universe, um, the effects from star formation and supernovae from massive stars, um, we were only seeing the, um, the, the gas, so we don't, we're not seeing the stars. But here, um, you can see the central um, supermassive black hole at the very center of uh, the galaxy and seeing how the gas uh, flowing in eventually uh, feeds into uh, the accretion disk that feeds the black hole. And so what's um, really cool about this particular simulation is that it's um, really one of the first, if not the first, um, according to the authors, um, to really um, show how gas at really large scales that um, many hundreds of thousands to millions of light years away um, can feed in and affect the conditions um, at um, tens of light years or hundreds of light years around the supermassive black hole at the center. And so astronomers and cosmologists are building these simulations uh, that are now uh, being able to show phenomena that um, span many, many orders of magnitude. And that's really important because uh, in order to understand what's happening with quasars, um, you have to be able to understand um, matter and, and how it um, is affected by all the different physical processes at multiple scales. All right, so with that, I, um, that is the end of my um, two stories. And I want to introduce Mark. Uh, Mark Nyrink um, is actually a Denver um, native and um, he was born and raised in Denver and he got his PhD at the University of Colorado in Boulder. And, in, um, and he works in um, cosmology and um, trying to um, understand the large scale arrangement of matter um, in the universe. So basically uh, the sort of web of matter that we saw in the previous um, simulation. And um, since his, um, he got his PhD, he's been a postdoctoral scholar at a number of different places, but currently um, he, um, as Mitch um, said earlier, he is a tenure um, track researcher um, at the University of the Basque Country in Bilbao, uh, um, Spain. But because of the pandemic, he is actually currently living uh, um, in Denver um, while working uh, for um, the university in Spain. Um, so um, as I said earlier, uh, Mark is also interested in um, sort of um, understanding how, how do you can use art and science together. And so his talk will uh, be a combination of those two. Uh, with respect to cosmology. So Mark, uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, take it away. Hi, Kachun, uh, that, was, that was really interesting. I, um, so I, I saw the, the, that cool uh, void that, um, that, that was very well within our galaxy, but um, I'm gonna be showing some voids that are much larger than that. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my presentation. Okay, so this is the so the origami cosmic web, which is in a spider web font because it actually relates to cos to spider webs as well, which I won't have much time to talk about. But uh, what I'm mainly going to talk about here is both the cosmic web itself, talking about uh, I guess expanding on what Kachun was showing in that last simulation where matter was being funneled into the, ultimately into the into the quasar um, looking at much small much larger scales than that but also I'm going to talk about some recent news that uh, that I and my collaborators generated and that was about spinning cosmic webs okay so here is a, a little picture of various scales in the universe. Um, so 
the the smallest thing here is a dreidel, which some of you might be might have used or considered using recently for Hanukkah. Um, that's, that's something that spins, and of course our our Earth spins, um, and it also spins around the 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 sun. So the sun spins. All of the, the planets spin around the the sun. Our solar system is a spinning object, and um, the, our, our whole solar solar system, of course, is it's just a one star, basically in this the galaxy, which is also spinning. Um, okay, and the, but a lot of people I think don't think that so much about the scales that are larger than galaxies. So what what does the universe look like when you zoom out from a galaxy? And the the nearest collection of of large galaxies around us is someone has called the Council of Giants. Um, this person, McCall, in 2014. Um, there's kind of an arrangement of uh, kind of a, a ring of galaxies around us. Our hap our, uh, we happen to occupy something called the local sheet, which is a very flat arrangement, so, which I'm going to show in a second. So here's the, the Council of Giants. Uh, here's a video showing it. So here's our galaxy. And sorry if it's a bit choppy, it's hopefully not too bad. So here's our galaxy along with Andromeda, the closest one, the closest big galaxy to us. Those are in red here. Those other galaxies are shown in yellow. Um, and this is not to scale, actually each galaxy is much smaller than these balls that are shown here. And if we tilt this arrangement, we see that it's pretty flat. That's called the super, super galactic plane or the local sheet. And it's going to spin a little more. And then it's going to show you what each of the galaxies looks like through a telescope. It's even more, each one is going to be even more enlarged. And we think this is basically sort of a, a chance arrangement of galaxies, but it happens to look sort of like a ring because we've truncated the, our, we, we're not looking farther than a certain distance. And so the, the, this is what all these galaxies are, are called and what they look like. Um, so here's, here's a, a uh, I've pulled the pictures from that video actually um, <laughs> to, into this, this slide here. Uh, we can see all of the galaxies together, and I've drawn some faint uh, purple lavender lines between them. Um, and that's because of these filaments that I'm going to talk about. Between each uh, pair of galaxies, there tends to be a what's called a filament of matter between them. And actually, one thing that I did over the pandemic, which uh, was to occupy myself, uh, <laughs> um, was to use uh, something called a slime mold, which is a type of fungus, or actually it's not entirely fung a fungus either. It's a, it's a very strange organism. That's This is all one biological cell that has uh, reached out from this, from the little white re rectangle and ventured out to these oat flakes that I put in a Petri dish and tried to guess what the arrangement of filaments around these galaxies would look like. So this is actually a, a relatively well-motivated process, which people have written papers about, but I won't go in further into that. Um, okay, so this is a this is from a computer simulation. This is shows a, a three-dimensional, so we're, we're rotating through this three-dimensional simulation. You can see galaxies uh, falling into each other and spinning. Here, the, the, the black stuff is uh, dark matter that's uh, whether when there's a lot of matter that comes together it makes this sort of web of dark of dark matter even though really the dark matter should be called invisible matter it's not actually dark we don't think um, but the 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 yellow things at the centers of these uh, blobs those are basically galaxies so um, how did this structure come to be well it's whoops it's basically just gal uh, gravity, as Kachun mentioned. Um, and here we, this, this is uh, a, a simulation that I rendered that is happening much more slowly than we usually see them go. And we can see that 
uh, these structures very gradually emerge out of basically a, a flat sheet where there's a little bit more matter, gravity grows uh, structures like these filaments that we see. So the, these folds that we see here, the, there are these, these pleats. Um, those are what we call filaments. This is actually a two-dimensional simulation for simplicity. But, but, but these, one thing that you might notice here is a very, it looks quite foldy. There's, there's, it's, it actually is a pretty good approximation to think of this as uh, a piece of fabric that's folding in many places. And so actually we can replicate that with, with, a, with fabric. Um, so this is a type of fabric called tulle, which is nice for making um, these, these workshops uh, work. Um, so here we have several uh, uh, collections of fabric that are bound together with colored rubber bands, which actually um, the, what, what, what we were trying to do here was um, is to reproduce the structure in this Council of Giants. So here um, you might be able to see some resemblance between this and and this. Well, it's pretty rough, <laughs> but um, but it was a good try, I guess. The um, so here, in, in, when you try to construct this out of fabric, you usually end up with a a, a pleat between two between pairs of blobs of gathered together fabric, just like in the real universe. This is, here, it's not gravity that's doing this, but the details of the material, but it, it happens to work pretty well. And, but if we try to do this with a non-stretchy material, then we end up with origami. So paper is not stretchy. stretchy. And that, of course, that reminds me, um, yeah, if, if, if you have some paper handy, that would be good to collect that soon. And even a, a pencil or pen, but of course, it, um, nothing's going to happen badly if you don't manage to do that. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, actually, it's, it's, uh, I've been getting into this study of origami a lot, which has led into other artistic things. But if you approximate the, the, this gathering together of fabric, with a non-stretchy material, which is paper that you can crumple and fold, then the simplest way to make a clump out of paper is called a twist fold. That's an origami term, which is a relatively obscure origami type of fold, but I'll, I'll show you how to do it relatively easily in a minute. Um, and actually you can generalize this, all this stuff, the origami to three dimensions. So this is a, a something that was constructed out of a three-dimensional sheet of paper, basically with folds. So here we have, and well, there's very little context so far, but it, you can see there's a Toblerone um, uh, in the corner that that references the triangular prism that's in the middle here, and that joins together a pair of yellow galaxies. Um, and so the um, Actually, in this in this uh, very approximate model of how this cosmic web develops, the you end up with a uh, fact that the a galaxy moves a galaxy spins if and only if some of its filaments are spinning. So because we see galaxies spinning, this suggests that also the filaments between the galaxies are spinning. Now this is a very approximate model. It's a toy, it's a literally a toy, toy model. So, um, so the, it's far from a proof, but that motivated me to look for, for rotating filaments in the cosmos. And the, these are intergalactic filaments. So they're very huge, but actually what, we found some. So this is from a, an, a computer simulation that, uh, that we analyzed. This shows, um, there's a lot going on here, but these these little golden comets represent uh, represent the velocity field in a simulation. Um, so here we we see 
the flow of matter around a filament, um, and it's very smooth, but you can see it pretty well that this this blob of of matter there, which is a galaxy, is joined. So there's a there's a filament coming off of it, and um, I'll play it again. Um, and maybe it's not super choppy. Who knows? <laughs> um, but you can probably see the swirling of matter around there. Um, and even better, this uh, in quick succession was confirmed in observations. So here is a a an ob observed cosmic web. This this is um, this is from what's called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which is a a, a fantastic observation of uh, well a survey of um, survey in the same sense as as a mapping operation is called a survey. A survey of millions of galaxies in our relatively nearby universe, relatively nearby being still hundreds of light years. Um, and these uh, these filaments, this web that you see here is actually was was inferred using a, an algorithm inspired by slime mold going looping back to the slime mold. Um, but the point here is that um, there was a recent discovery in in nature astronomy uh, by some people we know, um, I know, uh, that in, in general, uh, we have, if you see a filament of galaxies in the universe uh, joining two big clusters of galaxies, that that thing is, is rotating. Um, so this so maybe you, some of you are familiar with, with Doppler shifting. I think pr probably most of you are roughly familiar with that. In astronomy, um, things are called red shifted or blue shifted based on whether they're coming, whether they're going away from us or coming toward us. Um, so here on the left, there was a stack of a lot of observed gal uh, filaments along the sky that that were roughly in the plane of the of the sky, and each of them tends to be uh, a, sort of tilted, and and when we observe it, um, which means that the the galaxies on the top of it are well picking top as the one for which this statement is true. Um, so the so on one side of the filament, um, galaxies are are moving away from us, and the other side, the galaxies are moving toward us. That implies that it's it's spinning. And so here is a cool um, uh, illustration of that 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 these these people to put together. It looks like an umbilical cord, <laughs> um, but indeed uh, that that actually isn't a bad concept because um, these these filaments actually create matter onto galaxies or clusters of galaxies. So it's kind of like nutrients coming into a, a, an organism that's that's developing. Of course, not a, an organism in, our, in anything close to the usual sense, but um, you can think of it as some kind of life. So um, so the here's a little uh, haiku, um, which represents this concept, cosmic filaments twist fold origamically with non-zero spin. So here are some origami tessellations, and I will quickly show you how to make this. So I'm going to stop sharing. By the way, the, this is also related to structural things like spider webs, but I, we don't have time for that. But if you want to ask questions, that would be cool. Whatever, we have time for it. So um, an origami uh, galaxy. So I'm going to push this down a little bit so maybe you can see it. And what I want you to do with this piece of paper, this is a, it doesn't have to be this shape. It can be origami paper if you have it or whatever shape. Um, I want you to uh, decide on a point on there. So you could, you could draw it or just decide on a point. And um, and you're going to make sort of a, tri a, a triangle coming off of this. So um, if, if you have a, a pen available, 
um, you can even draw the, these lines. So just three lines coming off of there from in any shape. So you could have made these a little closer together. It doesn't really matter. And we fold, we fold along these lines, but only up until the, the, the point here. So you end up, you're going to end up with a little tent. So I'm just folding along these lines, but again, not folding past the point here. So we have a, a tent. So if we push this together, it's looks like this. And then um, using the pen, or again, it's you don't even really need to draw, but um, it helps to draw uh, some lines connecting points on there so that we end up with a triangle. So, so here's my triangle. Um, the, the lines come together on these ridges that are folded. And then fold these lines also in the same manner as the um, as you folded these. So we don't want to fold all the way across the paper, which is usually what people do in origami, but we only only fold until we reach the edges of these of each line. And so now we have a folded triangle with some spokes coming off of it. And what happens in a twist fold is that the triangle twists. So, so what you can do is uh, gather together the paper and actually it could help if more than one person is, is folding this, um, but gather it together a bit so that the, the tent is raised a little. And what, what you should do is make pleats on each of the sides of this. So decide on a, a way that it's rotating. So let's, I'm deciding that it's going this way. And so I fold a little bit on each side. So I'm going it all the way around this way. And then, and this is where it might help to have someone else to help to be folding this at the same time. What we want to do is move inward from these these pleats until we reach the middle and well it's not happening perfectly <laughs> for me either but in the middle we end up with a rotating thing so here is a <laughs> a very crude um twist fold galaxy okay so well, I'm about to, I'm almost done, but I'm going to show you that if we shine some light through this, um, we, we can see where there are multiple layers of paper and where there's just one layer of paper. And that actually represents how, in a pretty, in a physical way, where there's more matter or less matter in a gravitationally um, collapsed filament or little cosmic web like this. So thank you for for having me and I, of course uh, I can answer some questions. All right, wonderful. <clears throat> Mine came out very similar to your example, so <laughs> I feel like I did a good job. <laughs> All right, so we understand that uh, it is a school night, so if people need to leave, that is totally fine. Thank you so much for joining us. We'd like to stick around. Our uh, astronomers, I think, have a few minutes to answer a few questions. Um, and I did put in the chat Mark's website, so if you'd like to try again, um, I know there's a link on there to Folding Origami Galaxies, so you can check that out. All right, so we have some questions about galaxies, believe it or not. Uh, well, the first question is, Kachun, What's that background you've got? <laughs> well, it's actually from a movie um, called Down by Law. So I just extracted a short scene from that film and um, because it, it was cool looking and uh, was bound to uh, raise people's interest, which I guess it did. So. And then just really quick, uh, there's a conjunction of Venus, Jupiter, and Saturn this week. Because if you have 
Uh, any advice on how to look at that? Uh, other than uh, um, you know, going out you know, right after um, sunset uh, because you know um, those planets um, should be visible um, after sunset. So I recommend um, doing that you know after five p.m. Um, after um, when it starts to get really dark. All right. So right after sunset looks like yeah. December thirtieth. Yeah, so, oh right. Yeah. So the, the apparently Venus, Jupiter, and Saturn will be kind of in a, roughly in a line. Um, around December 6th or 8th. And also, by the way, December 7th is the, the earliest sunset of the year. Um, or, or, well, it's they're all very close to each other, 6th through 8 or 7. So you can look forward to the sunsets getting later after that. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right, so on to galaxies. Um, is there a universal plane that, uh, is there a universal plane? Does every group of galaxies have its own plane? Or... What's going on? Yeah, um, well, sort of. Um, so actually, this is one one way in which our galaxy is kind of special. We um, so we're in this thing that we call the local sheet, um, and well, the question is, does does every galaxy have a local sheet? And sort of, but but actually, ours is particularly large and flat for the amount of matter that's in it. Um, it's only like only like five percent of of sheets like like this have galaxies as large as the Milky Way. So that's, that's kind of cool. Uh, but in general, um, there are other sheets of galaxies, but, but ours is particularly flat and large, actually. All right, very cool. Um, so people are excited about the James Webb Telescope launching in December. How excited are you? And how soon will we get images? Well, um, I guess, you know, most astronomers are um, pretty excited um, just because it does represent, um, you know, a next generational leap in capabilities for telescopes. But I think, um, you know, most astronomers will also admit um, they're kind of at the edge of their seats too, because it, um, if you've looked online to learn about um, what the deployment scenario is for James Webb, um, it, isn't just launched into low Earth orbit like the Hubble Space Telescope, but it's actually launched much further away. And it also goes through this many months long process where the whole thing unfurls. And it's actually, you know, kind of a complicated uh, process. And in some ways, you know, you really are crossing your fingers that all of it goes smoothly because you can imagine, um, you know, there's just so many steps and it's so complicated that um, if there are failures, because the telescope is so far away, there um, you can't send someone to go fix it. You know, they they um, have to basically um, do it right the first time. So I think um, you know there there can be a lot of people who will be biting their fingernails for for several weeks after the launch. Right. And how soon do you think we'll get any data back from the telescope? Uh, I'm not actually sure. I, I don't know if you know, uh, Mark, but um, you know it takes. Usually, uh, many weeks, if not um, several months, for um, yeah. astronomers and the engineers to check out all the systems. Um, so um, we might not have, you know, actual first light that's made public, um, that's publicized, where you have we can see images for for a handful of months. You know, it could be two or three months. Right. Yeah. I don't know. Any, I don't think I don't know any more than than you do, Kajun. But I, I think I'm sure that's true. Yeah. All right. So. Another question about galaxy formation. For a galaxy like ours, a star like ours, how long did it take to uh, go from giant molecular crowd, cloud to star and star system? Yeah, the, um, the, the process for um, how molecular clouds collapse um, to form clusters of stars, uh, that's obviously you know, um, something that astronomers are still working out. Uh, but um, as far as the actual details, but we get the sense from both um, observations as well as um, more theoretical work that uh, this is, um, you know, once the process um, gets started, um, you basically have on the order of um, many millions of years uh, before um, star formation uh, picks up enough pace or where you have enough stars to start disrupting uh, the cloud, um, either through um, winds and jets, or if you have massive stars, 
um, they you know, start exploding in supernova and that can be extremely disruptive. And so it, it's at, at a minimum of, of a few million years and it could be as much as 10 um, or 12, 15 million years. Um, the, a lot of the details um, are still, I mean, even for clouds that we observe, it's still somewhat uncertain. I mean, if you think about it, we're trying to understand processes that take uh, many millions of years, but human lifetimes are a tiny, tiny fraction of that. And so um, what astronomers do is they uh, make observations of lots of different clouds, um, lots of different young star uh, forming um, clusters or young star clusters. Um, and so you're seeing uh, different um, stages of evolution uh, for um, the, these phenomena. And from that, uh, from these snapshots, you're trying to build a, a more complete picture of what that whole process is like. So, um, so that's um, sort of emblematic of all of astronomy, just because most of the phenomena that we are trying to study outside of our solar system tend to be um, take place at a much longer time scale than, um, than we can observe. Very cool, very cool. And uh, Mark, about those filaments that are twisting around, what do they contain? What are they made of? Well, um, they are uh, contain matter. <laughs> well, so they so they formed by because um, they were a little bit more dense than their surroundings, and so they so gravity collected mat matter there. So they're basically made made out of well, dark matter. I was implicitly showing dark matter in my presentation because that can actually pass through other patches of dark matter without colliding. Um, but also uh, gas is in filaments and even little galaxies. Um, and they, um, I see a question about whether they can become a super highway of sorts. Um, and uh, well, so I guess that depends what sort of uh, spaceship you have. If if uh, if you're worried about running into lots of matter um, and that that would slow you down with friction, actually it'd be bad to be going through a filament because there's more matter within the filament than elsewhere. But actually, I guess uh, one type of spaceship would be would have uh, um, I forget what it's called, but it would collect um, gas and use that as, as fuel as it's going along. So actually that would be a relatively good place to voyage through um, if you wanted to collect a, uh, some, because well, outside of a galaxy, it's very, it's very uh, sparse. There's very little matter. So it, it would help to go along a filament. So, and likely you would be going to another galaxy. So it helps also because the, um, the direction that you go to another galaxy is more dense. It has this filament. Um, and also I saw a question about the spider web idea, um, which is related to the filaments. So um, actually something else that came out of the or origami research uh, was a, was a work by an origami researcher named, uh, named Robert Lang, a former physicist actually also. Um, he's one of the few people in the world who earns a living doing origami and origami research. Um, and he uh, found, um, looking at some old uh, architectural uh, papers, that there's a connection between the types of uh, things that can be made like this, the, the, um, this twist fold with, with pleats, that, which is called a, a, an origami tessellation, if you have a bunch of these together in a pattern. Um, that actually corresponds perfectly to something that's called a spider web in structural engineering. And that's something that can be strung up to be entirely in tension. And it, actually, it, all, it also go, goes back to some work by the famous physicist of the 19th century, James Clerk Maxwell, who um, in addition to unifying electricity and magnetism, which was by far what he's best known for, he worked on architecture and structural engineering. So that was a really, Interesting thing that I thought. Um, so that's uh, so in the universe. One of these uh, one of these filaments. Um, what this implies for the for the cosmos is that if you um, have a map of all of the filaments in the cosmos, um, that that can be made into a uh, I don't know a three D print or a collection of threads that can be 
um, entirely in tension. Cool. <laughs> Very cool. Um, all right. Well, we have a great science fiction question. What are your thoughts on multiverse theory? And is there any evidence to back it up? Uh, Kachin, do you want to take this? <laughs> I was going to let you take it. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I guess so. There, uh, there, there are a couple of type. There are a few types of multiverses. Actually, what, what people usually mean by multiverses um, is, but I, I suspect that the question is about uh, like parallel universes that in in the in the many worlds um, interpretation of quantum mechanics where every uh, everything that could go one way or the other um, splits the universe into two different universes and you have this huge multiverse of all of the different possibilities. And um, uh, I think that's, well, I'm not aware of, of conclusive evidence for that, <laughs> for that theory. Um, I, I, I think it's, it's a, can be a good way to think about, about um, what's going on in the universe. Um, the, the number of possible possibilities explode, uh, especially when you think about, well, each, um, there's some random, well, when we don't think about when, when, so usually we think about choices in our life or something like that, but for every little uh, collision of molecules, there could be some little, little bit of randomness that could make the universe diverge. So it's, it's really a huge number of universes that, that explodes. Um, so in, in some senses that I think it's useful to think about that, but in other senses, well, I, I don't think about it <laughs> quite so much. All right, so it sounds like there's no solid evidence. No, that, but it can be a useful way of thinking. And as far as we know, there's no way to like go between parallel universes. But there's another meaning of multiverse that is used in cosmology that I'll briefly mention, and that's that each patch of the, the our universe we can only see to the edge of our observable universe. But there could be um, other other types of universes very far away from us, and actually there. There's arguably some evidence that when if well we can't go beyond the edge of our observable universe, but um, if we could, we might uh, observe something very different. <laughs> and that's well that goes back to um, some fine tuning of, of parameters like the cosmological cost constant that's causing our universe to accelerate in its expansion. And that that makes a little more sense if if that quantity can be drawn from a huge distribution, then maybe each universe has a slightly slightly different value of that. So that's the end of that answer. <laughs> cool. <laughs> um, all right, we have time for I think just a couple more questions. Um, getting somewhere on the line between science fiction and hard science, what do you think about string theory? Well, um, I I don't know a lot about <laughs> string theory. I, it, um, but it, well, so it's uh, it, it 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 makes some impressive sort of theoretical things fit, fit together. Um, but there isn't so far a, a a conclusive way to falsify the, this framework of thinking about how how particles are little strings. <laughs> um, so I, I, I'm, I think it's definitely something to pursue and study. Um, I haven't done it myself, <laughs> but, um, but it, it's, it, it's always good. I mean, it, it has some very good theoretical properties that it, it allows a, a lot of things to be unified in the same framework. So it's definitely something worthwhile in, in principle. So if anyone out there is working on string theory, keep working on it, and we'd like to see what you come up with. Right. <laughs> I imagine that question came up because you were talking about filaments in a very large way, holding the universe together. Yeah, so I was so. talking about uh, cords and threads, um, which as a way to uh, physically um, 
represent the structure in the universe. But yeah, those aren't real, those aren't actually connected to uh, the strings in string theory, unfortunately. <laughs> Or cosmic strings, which are yet another thing. <laughs> All right. Um, and then we're on a going down a rabbit hole now. Here's another one. Uh, some prominent uh, minds have said that they at least can't disprove that we're living in a simulation. Um, do you have any thoughts on that theory? <laughs> Could you end you? Well, I mean, uh, you know, uh, that is a kind of a philosophical argument that, um, you know, you can trace that back um, to Rene Descartes about whether, um, you know, um, we are all just um, brains that um, are being fooled by some a demon that's sending us, um, you know, information that um, stimulates our um, senses. And uh, so um, in many ways, um, it really can't be uh, proven or disproven. So I guess if you um, want to think that um, we are all um, living in the matrix and uh, being ruled by some artif uh, artificial intelligence uh, masters, um, I guess you can uh, feel free to do that. But um, I'm not certain that um, it can really be investigated by um, the science that we have today. All right, yeah. yeah I guess the, I have heard an argument that well, I, I'm not sure I believe the argument, but an, an argument that it's more, it's actually relatively likely that we're in a simulation because um, if it's possible to do that, then um, then sentient beings would, would eventually do that. Um, and then within that simulation, they would, they would also make further simulations and you could have a, a nested inception of, of simulations and um, if you count, well, if you're tricky about the way you, you'd count those, then you're more likely to be in one of those, that, given that they exist, which is not clear, um, than outside of them. But I, I don't, I mean, that's a, that's kind of a cool thought, but I don't, I don't see any reason to think we're in a simulation. <laughs> I, I, it's falsifiable if we're in a bad simulation, then we can see glitches, but so far we haven't seen them, I don't think. Well, that's comforting. We're either in a really good simulation or this is real life. So, <laughs> all right. Well, I think that's about all the time we have today. And of course, these questions are great because as we know, science fiction is always, often provides the seeds that drive real science. So it's always good to think about um, whatever cool possibilities. Um, thank you so much for your presentations. These were really, really interesting and wonderful. Um, and this is the last 60 Minutes in Space of this year, 2021. We will be back uh, virtually again um, so that we can continue to bring more people than would fit in the planetarium. And uh, so our next one is January 26th. Uh, that's a Wednesday. And we hope to see you then. And any final thoughts from our astronomers? Just happy holidays and we'll see you All next right. year. Yeah, happy holidays. Thank you so much for yeah, joining us, for everyone. Thanks Bye, everyone. Yeah, great, great to be here. <laughs> oh, and uh, this will be up on the DMNS YouTube channel if you want to enjoy some of those simulations over and over again, if you um, want to look back at some of that cool imagery. And thank you so much, everyone. Right. And good night. Okay. Good night, everyone. Good night.